Hey everybody, it is Customer in the Service, and I'm sitting here, I'm John Lemasny, and I'm and here I'm, with Sean. And I'm, hello, hello. <laughs> Who are you, Sean? I'm, uh, I'm Sean Petrowski. All right. And we have a couple topics we want to talk about tonight uh, regarding customer service and um, how businesses can treat their, ser their customers well so that they can keep them as customers, because there's a lot of competition out there today. And, uh, of course, it, it relates to all the things that we interact with all day long, whether it be education, whether it be how we get our food, whether it be the way that we treat our friends, right? Absolutely. All right. So uh, we have a couple topics tonight. Like I said, the first thing that I wanted to talk about was an experience I had at Starbucks over the uh, past week. And... I was visiting one of my favorite cities, local cities, uh, New Hope. You ever been to New Hope, Sean? Many times, many times. Yeah, I, we'll have to go sometime. I think it'd be fun with you there. So uh, I was in New Hope, and of course they have a Starbucks there like they have everywhere. And um, I try to stay out of Starbucks and Dunkin' Donuts and that kind of thing when I'm in a nice eclectic city like New Hope because there's so many cool places you can go. You know, there's little beautiful shops, and there's plenty of places to eat where, you know, they didn't show up on a big, huge uh, Starbucks truck. And so, for whatever reason, I ended up in that Starbucks. I guess I was just in the mood for a venti. And uh, there is, for, for those of you who are watching, you've probably been to Starbucks. It's sort of like saying, you know, you've probably been to McDonald's. Chances are... You have visited Starbucks, and you have, you know, been faced with the menu, and maybe you even had the experience of interacting with a barista, uh, where uh, you were schooled a little bit about the way that you should order, right? And we've talked about this before. We've talked about the idea that um, sometimes you'll get a little tip, right? We were talking about Qdoba, where the guy was like, you know what you really want to do? You probably want to order a grilled whatever, whatever. Right. Um, sometimes it can be helpful because it means that you're going to get a quicker order or there's going to be more clarification or whatever. Sometimes it's completely unnecessary because there's a computer-based interface like a Wawa. Right. And sometimes you get somebody who didn't get enough sleep the night before who decides that they can't understand anything that you're saying and decides to make it as though you are mumbling and turns a really simple transaction into something very, very difficult. And this is the experience that I had at this Starbucks. I'm not a, I'm not a frequent visitor to this particular Starbucks, but this is not the first time I've had this experience at Starbucks. And usually it has to do with the demeanor of the person who wears the cap of the barista. So uh, I was ordering maybe the simplest item on the menu. Uh, which is a venti, meaning dun -dun, super right. tall. Uh, I try to get a Sumatra. Sumatra's a, a dark roast blend. Um, I'm not sure what makes a Sumatra a Sumatra aside from the bean, but it, it's a particular type of bean, and they had you know a, a nice little menu up there. A little tiny menu comparative to the rest of the, you know, I don't typically get... Uh, coffee-based drinks. I don't typically get iced coffee. I don't typically get... I usually go for a regular cup of coffee, and I set it up over at the counter, and I'm happy. Um, I would love to have a latte sometime, and I, I don't mind cappuccino, but I usually don't get it at Starbucks because it's ridiculously priced. Um, so I'll either get, like, a tall coffee or a, a shot of espresso, sometimes both. But generally speaking, it's the simplest thing that they will run into in the course of their day. I'm not saying decaf. I'm not saying put cream in it. I'm not saying whipped cream. I'm not saying – it was not difficult. Right. And um, the thing was that I tried to order the Sumatra, which was up on the thing. They, they tell you what coffees are available because – there are probably 27 to 30 varieties of coffee that you can buy at a Starbucks. If you go to the Starbucks in Princeton, they have a clover machine. Yep. And the clover machine has the special um, capability of allowing them to offer more coffees because they do it on the spot. Right. They put the beans in the top, they get ground, they get made into a brew, and then it pops out a little puck. 
and you get a nice one of the freshest cups of coffee you'll ever have. They do not have clover everywhere. Do you know uh, why? I imagine it's because of the expense of the machine. That's right. I have a uh, a very a close family member of mine is a uh, manager at a uh, Starbucks in North Jersey, and we had a conversation about that. And she informed me that uh, Princeton is the only Starbucks in the state with a clover machine. Well, they all should have them because my experience there is that if I want a cup of coffee that is in any way eclectic, I can get it there. And sometimes I like a highly caffeinated brew. Sometimes I like a smoother brew. Sometimes I like less acid. Sometimes I like not, not to say that I'm an expert in that way, but if I frequent the Starbucks in Princeton, which I do, I could become more in tune. I could become potentially a better person as a foodie because I go to that Starbucks because there's more options there. Right. So anyway, they advertise on this little card up on the wall. They advertise, Sean. Yes. They advertise that these things are available. And I said, can I have the Sumatra? And she said, what? And I said, the Sumatra. Can I have a Sumatra venti? And she said, I'm sorry, I don't understand what you're... Sumatra. There's a Sumatra right on the wall there? Oh, we don't have that. <laughs> but I, I, I cannot express to you exactly how upset I was at that moment that of this thing. I, I run into it from time to time. I also was once in New York City in Central Park, and I was desperately hungry. I was ready to pass out because I didn't realize how far it was to walk. And I walked up to a pretzel cart that had a pretzel hanging on the side of the cart. Mm -hmm. And they had other stuff. They had hot dogs and sodas and, you know, $4 sodas. And I said, pretzel, can I have a pretzel? He said, what, what, what did you say? What did you say? And I said, can I have a pretzel? And he was like, oh, no, uh, sad story. He said to me, he said to me, sad story, we're all out of pretzels. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was so mad. So anyway, uh, this is a thing. This is something that I carry around with me. If you advertise something, you better damn well have it or else take down the advertisement. And if you have too much advertisement that you can't remember what it is that you're actually selling, then reduce the number of things you sell and focus on the things that matter. Right. Because otherwise, you're failing. And that Starbucks failed that day, not because they were missing Sumatra and not because they were necessarily advertising, but they, they didn't have... It, it, there was failure on multiple levels. And it was just a little tiny transaction, but I'll tell you what. I will probably not buy coffee at that Starbucks again. And that was not, I asked for the other flavor that was not Pike's Place. And they were like, oh, we don't have that either. And I, I scratched my head a little bit. You know, <laughs> I kept my cool. Um, and if it had not been for her general attitude, if it, if it had been just that they were out of coffee, I would have said, oh, that's too bad. Or if it had been that she was having an off day, but they had every coffee that they were advertising, that would have been probably okay too. Not great, but you know, if you if you're not present, you should be absent. Right. I mean, I generally feel that way. If you're not present, you should be absent. And if you can't be present, then you probably should have another job that doesn't face the public, because public facing work is important work. Because that's how you keep customers. You interact with them and you make them happy. One of the things I've begun to do in my everyday transactions with faculty is before I leave, I will specifically ask the question, as weird as it might seem, are you, are you happy with what happened today? And if they say no, we talk about it. Because I'd rather hear from them directly than to hear from somebody else later. You know, I would, I would much rather prepare for that. And generally speaking, because I have that question in my head, when, before I walk away, I, I want to know, you know, whether or not I did the best job I could have done or whether there was anything else. You know, you think about um, when a waitress or a waiter knows, service staff, knows that you are done your meal but asks you if they can get you anything else anyway. It's such a beautiful question. It's such a beautiful question because, you know, who knows if I just wasn't trying to interrupt them or whatever. You know, just that little tiny question, are you happy with what happened today or uh, is there anything else that I can do for you? 
is just an, an opening to have a larger discussion that improves on customer service. I did not get asked that question. I, not even close. And uh, they only do one thing there, really. They sell coffee. They <laughs> brew and sell coffee. They do one thing, Sean. That's right. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. and they got a place right across the street that does the same damn thing. And they had donuts at the other place. That's right. And I don't like donuts, but if I did, damn, why would I go to Starbucks? So, uh, and, and it's very specifically about the specific person behind the damn counter, which we've talked about before. Yeah. How, how much an entire organization, an entire brand can be affected by the person who you interact with is such an important idea. If, if our viewers take nothing else, they should take the idea that every associate in an organization represents that organization to the people they interact with. That's a uh, very powerful but true statement. Uh, and I just wanted to, I'm sitting here, I'm, I'm largely silent on this issue uh, because I do not, I rarely frequent a Starbucks. You don't drink coffee, do you? Uh, I do every once in a while. Like I had an espresso today in a wow. faculty member's office. Oh, very nice. Yes. Uh, um, I rarely frequent a Starbucks, and if I do, it is almost never alone. And I will. the reason that is the case is because I do not find Starbucks to be accessible. I find the uh, vernacular too difficult to comprehend. They make ordering way too difficult. The and, and you know I've seen the movie Role Models about eighty thousand times, and I sympathize with Paul Rudd's character who gives a who gives uh you know goes on a tangent about oh, I'll have a medium coffee, and then you know his girlfriend gives him a hard time saying you know it's a it's a venti or whatever it is, yeah. and uh you know I, I think it's that's one of the things about um Starbucks that really drives me nuts is that. You got to be like in this secret club, and even just to order a coffee. And s sadly, it, for me, going into a Starbucks, I might as well be at a French restaurant that only speaks French to their customers and accepts orders in French. I, like literally, if you were to ever accompany me into a Starbucks, nine times out of ten, I'll have to go with my girlfriend, or it's with Shane Smith, a friend of mine. And oh, either of them will order for me because order. I'll tell them what I want because I don't know what I don't know what I don't know how to order it. I don't, and they'll order it for me. What's and something it, typical that you will get in a Starbucks? A basic black coffee with nothing in it. Yeah, see, that's exactly what I ordered. Right, and so there's you that. Want, you want to? What? How big do you want it? It depends how I'm feeling that day. All right, so let's say you want a really large. Uh, that's that's never. I typically order the smallest one. Yeah, so you want like a tall. You right. want a tall Pike's Place. Right. And you would say that, and this girl would say, "What?" Right. Right. I never heard. I never heard of this Pike's Place thing. Oh, oh, the coffee that we make the, every day yeah. of our lives. Our basic flavor. Our basic flavor. Yeah. So I mean, I do not. I mean, look, I, I went into a Starbucks recently alone, the one in Hopewell. Um. What's going on? Oh. Nothing. Oh. And I ordered, I only went in there alone because I was going to order an iced tea. But here's the problem. When I got there and I read the menu, there was a layer of complexity to ordering an iced tea. I just wanted an unsweetened iced tea. And yeah. so I basically looked at the menu and I guessed. <laughs> and I, I turned out to be right. Um, but that to me is a huge... Huge turnoff for Starbucks because, you know, like I said, it's rare that I want coffee. And when I do actually want it, uh, Starbucks would not be my first choice because of the difficult time I have as a customer in the store. And that's not a reflection of the, the, the people that work there. That is not a reflection of the products that they offer. It is a reflection of the company's culture. Right. The culture in that store I, I, I find it to be a turnoff. I find it to be inaccessible, and I also find it to be exclusionatory. If that well, isn't even a yeah. word, exclusionary, exclusionary. What you what you are arguing 
is exactly the reason that people who frequent Starbucks often frequent it because they're in the in crowd or in in club of that culture. Yeah. And so, you know, I buy into that culture certainly. I I associate myself and associate my brand to be akin to a Starbucks brand or a Target brand and against a Walmart brand or a McDonald's brand. It's 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 funny because you know, you you think I, at least I do. I think of myself in terms of the the way in which the, I want to be represented, right? And part of that actually extends to the the things, the products that I buy, and the things that I'm willing to do uh, with my money. In other words, where I, where you put your money is where your mouth is, right? Right. So uh, we've talked about this many times with things like Wawa. I'm perfectly happy to give Wawa my money because I want Wawa to succeed and I want Wawa to continue and I, I like the feeling that I get when I go in there. Um, I can certainly see how Starbucks does not have that same open... I mean, it's like, for example, when you walk into the Princeton store, there are no windows partially because of the of the structure of the building but right. partially because they don't want they want it to be a closed sort of cavernous sort of uh, den like you know cave like thing they want it to be somewhere to get away from the the rest of the world and it's an interesting sort of way that they integrate their culture into that space and the space into their culture uh, that that vernacular that you're talking about, the lexicon of Starbucks, is definitely a barrier to entry. And so people have to make some level of investment if they're going to frequent a Starbucks. They have to, at the very least, memorize to some degree what it is that they want. You know, and you think it, it, that really happens with with lots of different places. When you, if you, to use McDonald's as an example, if McDonald's didn't exist, what would Big Mac mean? Nothing. Right, you walk into a you walk into a Five Guys and you ask for a Big Mac. What's going to happen? Unless you're Chuck Norris, they're going to look at you like a right. like you're an alien. Right. So it, it's one of those things where uh, the vernacular, vernacular and lexicon is definitely associated with the culture, and and you have to make some level of investment in order to uh, in order to participate. And it's so funny, even restaurants sometimes do it, like especially on the kids' menu. My kids will go out to go to a restaurant and I'll say, where do you want to go? Uh, and they'll, you know, we'll list a various number of places, Princetonian or Michael's on Route 1 or um, Cheeburger, Cheeburger, which just opened up on Nassau, or Wendy's. You know, there's all these places and they all make the same kind of food but with differing levels of success and different feelings and different cultures and different uh, attitude and different service and different all those things. That's what I'm thinking about. My kids are just thinking about uh, where are the most delicious chicken tenders, you know? Right. And what's funny is we recently went to the Princetonian and uh, my youngest son wanted chicken tenders as he does most of the time. He never eats them but he always wants them. Uh, sometimes it's French toast, but most of the time it's chicken tenders. So anyway, at, at the Princetonian, they have a menu that has a kids section that has names for all of the food, right? Do you know any of these? Uh, I know the typical diner names. Uh, yeah. I don't know the Princetonian, but like Mickey Mouse. Mickey Super Mouse. Superman. The Cowboy. He man He man right. At the Princetonian, they call a chicken finger and fries dish for kids the big bird, right? Yeah. Big so bird. My, Get it. my son glommed on to this. Right. To the degree that we were going to go and get chicken tenders somewhere else, and he said, do they have the big bird there? And I said, no, that's really a Princetonian thing. And, and the thing was that I said chicken tenders and fries to the waitress, or he said chicken tenders and fries, and she corrected him. And she said, you mean the big bird. And I said, actually, he means chicken tenders and fries. And she didn't understand why I was trying to, like, not brand him, you know? Right. Because she doesn't know that I'm whatever, who I am. 
but I was specifically a little bit offended by that. She she didn't she wasn't doing anything wrong per se. She was she was doing what she should do, which is to interest kids in a special experience about chicken tenders, which are just you know trash really. <laughs> <laughs> but if you give trash a name, all of a sudden trash has a name, right? Right. So. Uh, same with a Big Mac, you know. You, sometimes you just want a. I don't want a Big Mac, but sometimes you just want a Big Mac because it's a Big Mac. And when you when you buy into that, just like sometimes I want a f in Sumatra, <laughs> venti, because it's a Sumatra venti. Right. Right. And I can't get that at home. I could get it at home, but I don't. I I get it at Starbucks because it's like a special treat. Not that special, but it's something. You know, it's got a name. Right. So. Uh, with the Big Bird thing, like I realized how effective that was in getting us to go back to Princetonian, <laughs> so as to not upset my four-year-old, because he wants the Big Bird. He doesn't want Dunkin' Donuts coffee. He wants Starbucks coffee. He wants Sumatra venti, right? Yes, he does. <laughs> so anyway. Uh, that whole thing, that whole thing of naming things is brilliant because all of a sudden it associates this other whole ideology to something that's very average. It's like when uh, Apple calls a video port uh, Firewire, or not not video port, but display a, a, port. A display port uh, Thunderbolt. Right. You know, it, it means something because it is something, regardless of the standard that it represents. It means something above and beyond that. So, anything else you want to say about Starbucks? No, I mean, again, like, I think it's just really important for me to make it clear that, you know, Starbucks is, like, literally the only place in the world where they sell a product that I would consume and I would rather go anywhere else because it doesn't make me feel like a douchebag when I walk in. In the sense that Yeah. Like I feel like I feel um what is the word? I want to use a word that's not gonna offend anybody. Um deprecated? I don't even know what that means. It, you, you you feel shit upon? Yeah, no I mean like no, I feel less than. Like I feel like I am a leper. That's what I meant to say. Like, I belong on a leper colony because I don't know how to order a cup of coffee. I'm highly offended that you use the term leper. Okay, well. But like I said, I can't think. There's no other place in the world except maybe a French restaurant that only accepts orders in French. Where I'd have to go, and I have to go with someone and have them order for me. That's ridiculous. <laughs> It's absolutely ridiculous. It would be a small threshold for you to, to pass in order to be able to go into Starbucks and order what you want. But I, I know exactly what you're saying. But I don't want to cross yeah. that threshold. It's and, stupid. And it's so – it's moronic. And, and I get it. I mean – They're specifically I, trying to do it too. Yeah, I know. And that's the thing that really irritates the shit out of me because, like, I've done extensive research on Starbucks as a corporation. And this may be a topic for another day, but – uh, I am not a fan of Starbucks, the company. Let's not even talk about the in-store culture or the product or whatever. But Starbucks as a corporation, in my eyes, is just as evil as Walmart. You you know, uh, I think that we will probably find out that that is true. If, I mean, you, it sounds like you already know, but I'm saying um, I think that the more I know about Starbucks, the less I want to be a part of that culture. Yeah, and you know that's what that's what did me in. Like, I really kind of had no opinion of Starbucks. Uh, I did a couple case studies as part of my MBA st program on Starbucks, where I learned about these like straight up real world business situations and how they acted as a company. And I was like, this is this is mildly disgusting that this is what's going on outside of America. Uh, so you know, uh, because of that. You know, I feel dirty about even going there on top of the fact that they make me feel, you know, like I said, like a leper because I don't know how to use their code words. And God forbid I say I'd like a mild regular coffee. You know, God forbid I say that. Then I'll be made to feel even more like an outcast, like what, even more, which I don't even know how that's possible. But 
I, I've been in that situation where I've walked up to the counter. Like the first time I went to the Starbucks in Princeton after working for the university and I said, uh, I'll take a medium, regular dark black coffee. And the person was just like, like, what is that? Okay. And they like made a face at me and I was just like, ah, <laughs> so like, that's it. And that, that, you know, that's for me, this, this, this topic has been, you know, in, I'm in the backseat on this one because it's, it's not an enjoyable experience for me in any way. And I don't even really like the coffee that much, honestly. Yeah, there, I like, I love, I love the coffee. There's coffee. one, there's one flavor that they've ever had. And it was like uh, some kind of Christmas blend blonde or something yeah. that they had last year, and I was like, "Wow, this is this is good." But you know, it was only for Christmas time, and that's it. And who knows yeah. if Bubble Series? Well, that exclusivity plays into that whole thing too. I mean, they 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 just showed up with uh, their pumpkin spice roast. Yeah, oh yeah, it's because it's autumn now. Yeah, people just go nuts for it, you yeah. know, and they buy up bags of it at twelve bucks a pop. Anyway. Uh, Sean, do you drive? Do I drive? Yes, yes. Before I bought my home, my second, my my second home, next to my whatever rental property I was living in, was always my car. Yes. Okay. And uh, have you ever driven me anywhere? Uh, yeah. I mean, not any long, any long distances, but we've driven together. Yes. Yeah, sure. We I think we've been to Atlantic City, right? Oh yeah, that's right. I forgot about that. Yes, and we've we, driven to Atlantic City. Yes. We, we once went to uh, a high school where one of your relatives works. My father. Yes. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, that was that was also a lengthy drive. That's right. right. Uh, so uh, when we went to Atlantic City, chances are, actually, you may have avoided them, but chances are, we went through a toll. We went through them. I don't avoid them. Yeah, and uh, are you a are you somebody who goes through the uh, cash only lane or the easy pass lane? Why don't you take a guess? You, <laughs> you're an easy pass user, yeah. Born and bred, my friend. Yeah, me too. So, uh, as somebody who experienced having easy pass and knows the joy of uh, avoiding the pain associated with the mandate of bridge tolls and, and uh, turnpike tolls, etc. Somebody who just drives right through, sometimes at 15 miles an hour, sometimes at 45, depending on that double lane, that beautiful double lane on the way down to uh, Cape May. Right. Um, why would anybody not have easy pass? Oh, I can think of about a million reasons. Tell me why. Reason number one, they live. They are from a state that does not participate in the Easy Pass program. Reason number two, they feel as though they are being tracked by Big Brother if they have an Easy Pass in their car. Reason number three, they don't understand what using Easy Pass actually entails and thinks it's more expensive than it really is. Uh, reason number four, they travel for business and are required to get a receipt upon paying a toll. Which does not matter, of course, because Easy Pass records every transaction and makes it available to you in spreadsheet format. Sure, but these are these are these are the multitude. Of, these reasons are the examples I've been given over the years. Are any of those reasons valid? Absolutely, zero of them are valid. Yeah, I agree. Oh, well, except if you're from an outside state. Well, but uh, while they do not have Easy Pass across the country, they do have implementations of Easy Pass technology, which I believe is RFID. Is it not? Uh, I don't know, actually. I've never actually explored. I do know that it is radio-based, but I do not know if it is RFID-based. I, I thought that it was maybe an enhanced RFID, but uh, I have not investigated it. And I do not need to because the beauty of EasyPass is its simplicity. You essentially put the, transco the transceiver on your windshield or on your dashboard or keep it in your pocket and uh, drive through, and it essentially does a transaction for you that you would normally have to sit like a douchebag in line and exchange some sort of money. Or you'd have to search for change, which uh, has always been, in my opinion, far more dangerous than using the phone. I agree. Absolutely uh, agree. Yeah. So uh, we, we would agree that Easy Pass is a good idea, yeah? Absolutely, without a doubt. And uh, by way of this podcast, I, I wanted to use them as sort of a model for 
w what I think is really emerging as a promoted way of thinking of customer service in, in our podcast. You know, I think that we prefer certain ways of doing things and avoid other ways of doing things and would expect that companies that we like would do things more like the way that we enjoy. You know, like we've talked about Wawa at, at, at uh, length and talked about how beneficial this computer-based interface is and one of the reasons that I think we've talked about it so much and tried to play it up is because I always wonder why it's not in every deli everywhere. That's a great question, yeah. Right? So, I mean, computer-based interfaces can simplify the process, clarify the order, uh, gives you a common point of reference between the service and the customer. And uh, that clarification eases the transaction, in my opinion. And I believe yours also. Absolutely, without a doubt. And there are some parallels between what's going on with the uh, computer-based interface at Wawa and the RFID or similar wireless-based uh, interface in uh, EasyPass. It is smoothing the transition between doing the activity that I'm doing, paying for that activity, and doing the thing that I'm doing again. Right, so normally at a at a deli that does not have a computer based interface, I have to interface with a human who is per perfectly capable of reading off of a screen, but for some reason has to interact with me. I I wish that there had been a computer based interface at the Starbucks last week. Absolutely. I wish so desperately there had been a computer based, and I could have said, "Venti, place place." And at Wawa, another beautiful thing is. When you order, you know that that thing is present because they take it off the damn screen. That's right. They take it off the screen. We didn't have to have a transaction. Nope. They didn't have to take it off the board. No. If it's not on screen, it's not in the Wawa. Right. It's in some dude's stomach. Right. Somewhere. Uh, Easy Pass is a much simpler process. I drive through this drive through and um, it takes money out of my pocket. What I would really love is if Wawa would implement EasyPass in, in, a, in a straightforward way right at the kiosk. Why is there even a register system at all in a Wawa? You mean why is there a, a human person there? Why can't no. I just swipe for my sub and pay for it at the no, deli kiosk? I, I don't want, yeah, I don't want robots making my sandwiches. No, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is... Touch screen order at the kiosk, then you get your total at the kiosk, and then you just go, whoop, swipe it, done. Right. Or if I had a key fob that had my information on there already, right. and I had to put in a code when I walked up to the kiosk in the same way that I do at the end of my transaction at the register, right. what, you know, what, why can't I just make that all a single transaction? Well, I think we're I think we're heading there. I think with uh, the proliferation of NFC and mobile devices and uh, Apple's adoption of Passbook as a uh, mobile payment solution, I guarantee you that we will be seeing more of that. The smart uh, the smart card based payment systems and the RFID payment systems, you know, in, in physical cards, never really caught on. They were I always viewed them as stopgap solutions for NFC technology, but it, we're going to have it. It's going to be, I'm saying we're within three years, we're going to be paying for food at Wawa in the way you described. Okay. And for the companies that are not Sheets or Quick Check or Wawa, right? who who, who I refer to as the triumvirate of success. The triumvirate, I love that. I love that. We should make a shirt with that, <laughs> with our logo on the back. Yeah, we should. We totally. Should. We should sponsor a 5K. Right. <laughs> 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 the Sheets Wawa Quick Check 5K. They have hoogies at the end. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Uh, and I understand, like, there's still coffee. Like, I still probably have to have some sort of a non... But, I mean, I could order that damn coffee at the touchscreen, too. You could. As a matter of fact, I, I can. I can order a smoothie at the touchscreen. Right, you can. And I can order soup at the, t the touchscreen. And... Uh, it could just easily be at Quick Check. They actually have automated uh, 
automated uh, quick checkout. And if you go to the one on 130 just above Plainsboro, above Cranberry, is it above? Yeah, above. Uh, they, at certain times in the night, don't have anybody on register. You go to the kiosk, you order your sandwich, you walk up, you scan it, you have your coffee, you scan the cup, you put them both in the tray, you put in your credit card, you walk back, get your sandwich, and leave. That's amazing. I don't even know about this. And i got, I got to try this out. Yeah, it's beautiful. I mean, it brings the, the beauty of a supermarket uh, checkout, you know, the, the automated checkout, to your convenience store. What's more convenient than that? There's nothing. Nothing more convenient than that. Yeah, so I think Easy Pass is a model. I mean, I think we're starting to, as we talk about more and more things and start to see the, the problems with human-human interaction and the benefits of computer-human interaction, especially in service pr provisions, that we can see great benefit and allow the service to focus on service and the human to focus on the request and finishing that transaction. You know, and you, when you use Amazon, you do not interact with a human. Nope. Even when it's delivered, very often you don't get to meet that human. No. And I don't care to meet that human. I'm sure she's a very nice lady. I don't need to know her. And she does not need to know me. And the less we know about each other, probably, the better. So... I, I just uh, wanted to bring up EasyPass as a model for success in the same way that I think we've exemplified Wawa as a success. I'd like to add two things to the EasyPass discussion. Okay. There's two things that EasyPass, I, I think that EasyPass has made, has evolved over the years. There were, there were things about EasyPass when it was initially in, implemented that were kind of like, eh, this is all great and everything, but I really wish these things weren't going on with EasyPass. And over the years, EasyPass Easy has evolved over, to their credit. They have evolved. And there are two things that they've done to me that I think are pretty groundbreaking. The first one is recent, uh, a couple years ago, they did away with the license, the one transponder per car um, requirement. So what it used to be was you'd register your license plate and your transponder, and that was one vehicle, and you could never break them. So I don't now, even remember that. Did, did uh, they that, did that at one yeah, point? Early two thousands, late nineties. Oh, I didn't. I, I guess I was a late adopter. And now, then this is something that happened a couple of years ago. You can register as many license plates as you want and have one transponder. And you just move from car to car to car to car, and it doesn't matter. Yeah, uh, we've been Easy Pass customers for so long in my family that my dad had four Easy Pass transponders for our family. My car was one, my sister was another, my mom was a third, and he was a fourth. We've and that has been our the way we've operated in our house. Like I said, since the since probably 1999, 1998, wow. and. Easy Pass recently contacted him within the past year and said, you can't have four transponders anymore. And that was because they, they made this change of, listen, you can register as many cars as you want, and you can move that transponder from car to car to car. Uh, and so, you know, my dad was like, hey, but I'm a family. We have four people. There are four drivers, blah, 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 blah. Uh, and, you know, he was able to keep them at bay for a couple months, but eventually boiled down to me having to divorce myself from the family Easy Plan account, which I needed to do at age 30. I think I can pay my own tolls. Yeah, probably. And uh, so I have my own Easy Pass now, and I can register as many cars as I want. And they even will allow you, like if I'm in a, a car, like uh, let's say you're going to drive me somewhere and you forget your Easy Pass. I got mine. I can throw it in the car. No big deal. Not a problem. Um, you know, if they'll send you a letter and you say, hey, I was in the car or, or whatever, it, they make it very easy. You know, it's not a big deal anymore. It's funny. I, I I have done this and never thought that it would be an issue. I uh, you know if I'm with somebody who does not have Easy Pass, which is always surprises me, um, 
I will take my transponder along just so we don't have to wait in line yeah. or search for change or any of that nonsense. That didn't used to be the case, and that was a change that they made, and I think that's a great change. Yeah, see, it's it's that ubiquitous now that uh, it, it seems to make the sense that it always made, but I guess it just didn't always make that sense. The other change that they made, uh, which I don't know exactly when it came into effect, but the first time I ran into it was in uh, the year 2005 or 2006. And there's only one location I know that this happens, and I, I would really appreciate it if it rolled out to more, is have you ever been in Newark Airport, John? Yes, I have. So do you very, know what I'm going to mention? Very recently, yeah. When you what can go, you do? What can you do at Newark Airport with your EasyPass? You pay for parking. How brilliant is that? That is so brilliant. Right. And here's and here's the thing that I think that's amazing about that. Think about parking garages. Okay? You go in the city of Philadelphia. Oh. Who operates the parking garages? City of Philadelphia. Well, I don't know about that, but it's the Philadelphia Parking Authority. Whether that's a government entity or a private entity, I don't know. But there is a united parking authority that controls... I don't know, 80% of the parking garages in the city of Philadelphia? Yeah. Why would they not have easy, po easy pass transponder except, you know, I roll in, I roll out, we're out. Why do I have to travel downstairs in the Princeton lot in order to pay my uh, parking at all? Why can't I just pay for parking on floor four? Why can't they have another one of those? Why, why can't I use easy pass to get out of the parking garage? That's a great question. I think the Princeton Spring Street Garage is one of the worst run parking garages I've ever experienced in my entire life. I would not agree, but um, I've had a lot of friendly interactions there. I actually was watching one of our uh, former episodes. Yes. And I've remembered you having to go into the office. Multiple times. And I've had to go into the office multiple times, too. Those guys, nice guys. Don't get me wrong. Nice guys. And they will help you with anything. And, and I would not want to have their job for anything. No. Because their job is very difficult, and it's mostly about customer service. Sometimes technical, sometimes um, just, you know, being a nice face when somebody has a problem. Right. But how many times a day do they have to get up and, like, lift up the arm of the parking garage? Probably more times than they really should need to have to. You, you are correct. This can be solved with technology and should be. Absolutely. But, uh, I, there are many improvements that they could make. And because it's Princeton, I think that you have a certain expectation that it will be that way. And when it's not, it's upsetting. They, they have a tougher customer base than most, I think, too. I think people, uh, this is a generalization, but it's one that I run into. People in Princeton have a certain level of expectation of service that you might not run into elsewhere. You might be willing to wait in line or whatever it is if you were somewhere else. In Princeton, there's a certain uh, height of expectation of service. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make one point about Princeton that I think will prove your point perfectly. Okay. And I, when, I, when I say what I'm about to say, it should be a reason why the problem that we're talking about in the parking garage should be solved. But for whatever reason, it's not. And what I'm going to say is this. The first place in New Jersey that I've ever experienced the ability to pay for parking with a smart card was Princeton. There's no, you know, years ago. They've had smart cards before anybody else. Yeah. And they've been in place for probably you know, I don't know, 10 years. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And they were ahead of the curve on that. So why are they not ahead of the curve with improved parking parking garage technology? I, I don't know. I mean, but these things that we talk about, about why is a successful technology, I mean, maybe it's patent issues, or maybe it's the cost of having multiple kiosks or whatever. But I would, I would if I was a betting man, I would say it's the cost of multiple kiosks. But then again... I can tell you I've been into a billion parking garages in Philadelphia and there's nine kiosks for me to pay at in the lobby. Right. Like literally there's nine of them. So, and it's the same idea. You get the little ticket, you put it in, you put your card in or your cash, 
it spits it back out and you're done. So yes. what's going on? Princeton, New Jersey. You know, uh, people are paying, you know, 40 grand in, in property tax over there and they can't get more than two kiosks in a garage. Yeah, I don't know what that's about. I, I definitely don't. And it's the same way over at the, uh, the not Spring Street garage, but the other garage on Back the other Street. side. Yeah. Right. So I, I'm not sure what that's about, but um, we are getting real close to your time. So let's move on to our next topic. Yes. Uh, which is, where's your fucking phone number? Yes, where is your fucking phone number? And uh, the reason I bring this up is, uh, I've, this is an agreed upon topic, but um, I remember typing it in. And I, I'm, I'm sure you know what I'm going to talk about. How often have you needed to talk to a human and needed to resolve some issue and you have searched extensively on a website for some other method than email to communicate with somebody. You 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 brought up an example last week yep. about the Fitbit, yeah? Yeah, it was a week or two ago, yeah. Yeah. If you try and talk to somebody about a Fitbit, it's very difficult if you're trying to get a hold of Fitbit Incorporated or Fitbit LLC or whoever it is. Uh, and it makes perfect sense why that is, yeah? I mean, they don't necessarily want to have a bank of phones that they have to manage. They would much rather use the asynchronous nature of email, and they figure that they can meet all the emotional needs and in interaction that an email provides. Um, but sometimes you just want to talk to a human. Right. And uh, that certainly has its risks. Right, you can have somebody who is having a bad day, like that lady at Starbucks, right? Who can make a situation worse instead of making it better. And plus, uh, while you can record calls, uh, audio recording is much more expensive data-wise than email recording, which happens by default, happens right. by the nature of email. Right. So I understand, but it doesn't make me any happier when I need to do that and can't. And um, I just figured we would talk about that for a few minutes before we have to break it up. Well, you know, I've, I've, Fitbit's not the only company. I mean, I remember very early on in my Netflix subscription. I've been a, Net, a Netflix subscriber since the year 2003. Uh, we're talking very early on in the Netflix life uh, lifespan. I had to reach them about something. I don't even remember what it was. And I remember, like, Goog I, I had to Google it. I think I heard the story before. You were telling me that you had to return a disc or something. Uh, I don't know. I don't remember what it was. I, I, I really I don't remember if it was a billing issue or maybe it was, uh, you know, I got more than one disc and didn't know what to do with it. I don't remember. But I had to call somebody and... I remember, like, I couldn't find it on the website anywhere, and I remember Googling it, and there was a guy, I don't know, I bet that if we looked for it, this website still exists, and it was literally, like, www.netflixestollfreenumber.com, and it was, like, I had problems finding Netflix's number, and this is ridiculous that I had to do all this, but I've created this website for people that need to call Netflix. Here's the number, and, that, and then it was, like, blinking HTML text. Like for the number, and that's how I found, that's how I found the number for Netflix. It was ridic absolutely ridiculous. I, I would imagine it's probably not as bad now, but I mean, who knows? Maybe I, I don't know. I've never had to contact them again. I think there's a lowered expectation on the part of consumers to find a phone number. I think that people expect that they will um, probably be relegated to email anyway. Plus. The presence of a phone number is not any sort of a guarantee that you are going to get an answer or service. Right, or even someone's going to pick up the phone. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I remember in the dying days of CompUSA uh, calling about some item that I really, really wanted and didn't want to travel a half an hour just to find out that they didn't have it or that whatever. I mean, there's something about stock. I don't have to worry about that at Starbucks unless you're going to New Hope. Uh, but uh, they have a phone at New Hope, uh, Starbucks, I'm sure, and she's probably on it right now. But uh, if I need to see, like I would have loved to have talked to somebody at Best Buy about the Fitbit, and not at Best Buy, at any of the other six places I tried. 
Uh, but the other six places I tried did not pick up. They, they just didn't pick up the phone. And if they had, I guarantee they would have said, what's a Fitbit? Mm -hmm. you know? So uh, I think that it's, it's an interesting problem. You know, and meanwhile, you and I are speaking right now over video chat. Right. It's a, an extended and rich conversation because you're able to see how my hands move and I'm able to see that you're smiling and, you know, whatever the case might be. Uh, I'm not expecting that level of interaction, but a phone call versus a text-based interface, I mean, how many times have you th thought about how a conversation is going over text and saying, God, I wish I could talk to this person right now, you know, because we'd be able to resolve this issue immediately. Yeah, right. I've had that happen to me, not, you know, not so much really anymore because I've learned to abuse the chat system, if you will, to get what I want. Um, I do it all the time, actually, now. I'm to the point where I prefer chatting uh, virtually with text as opposed to a phone call now at this point because I've learned how to play that to, to my advantage. You know what I mean? You're saying, like, you know, whatever, you're, you're done with the conversation and you just sort of spontaneously go, oh, something just came up and you, like, split from the convo? No, no, in the sense that I, I've actually find that, okay, it might take me twice as long to solve my issue with a chat, but it'll be less annoying for me because, and here's my experience, I use, I use text-based chat support all the time with two companies in particular. One is Dell and one is Electronic Arts. And both companies I've called in the past over telephone. And the problem with calling both of them over the phone is that you are often on hold for 30 to 45 minutes. And my experience has been if, if you go on chat, maybe you'll hold in a chat queue for five or ten minutes. And I'd rather wait there for five or ten minutes because then I'm not doing this with my phone to my ear. And then, I'm, you know, the hold music cuts in and out or it rings. I can't tell you how many times I've been on hold for 45 minutes and my phone call disconnects. Oh. It's super frustrating. Yes. So if I, if, if I go in the chat, I know that there's a level of technology there. It's going to almost guarantee that my issue is going to get resolved. And then when I finally do get a chat agent, I, I've learned to, look, to manipulate them and manipulate the situation to get what I need. Plus, um, it's being recorded in the same way that we talked about email being yeah. In other words, there's a transaction. So you can say, on October 12th, I said this at this time during the day, didn't hear from you for two days. What the hell's going on? Um. The one thing that I want to point out, I think, is a, a, a great example of a company reversing their unpublished phone number stance. And I think implementing, even though they're not publicizing their phone number, have implemented an, a, an even greater system is Amazon. Now, it used to be you could, you could not get Amazon on the phone if your life depended on it. It used to be that way. Now... They have a, a support system that is, I think, the model for all online organizations in the sense that they, when you report a problem, you, t you, know, you, you, you type in what your problem is, it hits their knowledge base, and they're saying, hey, do any of these questions fit what you're doing? And you can read it, or you can even not read it. It doesn't matter. And, and then if you, know, you need to touch base with somebody, you get three options. It, hey, you want to chat with somebody right now? Hey, you want to send an email? Or hey, do you want us to call you? Yeah. That is to me, that's the way it should be. Give me those three options. Give me, And then they even give you wait times. That's yeah. a, another beautiful thing. Hey, listen, we have a five to seven minute wait on the chat, but we can call you right now. Or, you know, we're, we're backed up on the phone. You can chat somebody now. We're busy on both. Why don't you send us an email? We'll get back to you in, you know, two to three hours. Yeah. That's, that's how it should be done. That's the model. That's the bar. Let's see everybody else get to that. So you're, you're possibly renaming this segment to where the fuck's your phone number and uh, what can I do with it? Yeah, absolutely right. Absolutely right. Well, um, as usual, we've had a fantastic time. We're at the end of our hour. Anything else you want to say, Sean? I just want to say that, you know, uh, since we've launched in a podcast format, 
uh, as of last week, um, I've gotten a lot of feedback from people uh, saying, hey, I'm so glad that you're in podcast form now. I can listen to you on the go. I'm not a slave to my web browser anymore. Uh, people that have wanted to, to check the show out uh, who haven't been able to sit down and watch it are now, you know, I, a friend of mine watched, uh, you know, listened to five episodes in a row. So, you know, that's probably like six to seven hours of content right there. Yeah. Uh, you know, so people are really into the podcast format. People are, are touching base with us to let us know that they really like what we're doing. They love the information. They love what we're talking about. They find our discussions interesting. So we hope to keep you guys satisfied. We hope you keep coming back. And uh, we'll look forward to talking with you all next week. And uh, I've enjoyed it immensely myself, and I think it's an important topic, and I wouldn't want to talk about it with anybody else, Sean. Same goes here, man. All right. I'll see you next week. All right. See you next week. Bye. Bye.